don't want what we know out there. How a person can go from really almost nothing to becoming a millionaire by owning rental property. He would always buy these flip houses, and I just remember thinking, this guy is crazy. Why would he buy that house? In the past decade, there's been a huge surge in the peer-to-peer short-term rental market. Become an insider. So you have to know the rules before you get the game. Every second counts. So make every second count. Welcome to the Real Estate Jam. Whether you're just beginning or the best of the best, we're glad you're here. We will share successes, failures, and strategies for the action-taking real estate investor. And now to your hosts, JD, Annabelle, and Melissa. Welcome to the Real Estate Jam podcast. I'm JD. Thank you for joining us. And as always, I have my beautiful co host Annabelle and Melissa. And for those of you who are wondering, this is take two because we had a office chair fiasco, an internet fiasco, a Zoom meltdown, and a couple of angry people. But we're going to be back at it again. And speaking of challenges, today, we want to go over some of the challenges that we faced in our business and uh, really in our life over the last six months or so, because when we started this podcast, we said that we were going to bring you um, our successes, our failures, our challenges, uh, interviews with experts. And we've done a lot of those things, but we haven't had our challenges podcast And uh, what better way to start the challenges podcast than with uh, a chair falling down and internet problems, which is part of our everyday life. Uh, girls, thanks for being here with me. Well, we appreciate you and everything you do. It's hard because you're kind of grouchy, so. Yeah, sometimes, if anyone knows JD. <laughs> but real estate makes them happy. Mm-hmm. Yes. So that's one thing we definitely want to keep working on. Um And yeah, with this episode, we just want to share with you, you know, a a few things that have been challenging for us since the new year, um, which are developing our team, hiring the people we need, both um, stateside at our brick and mortar office, as well as as virtual assistants. And then we just like to touch on how COVID-19 just wreaked havoc on our plans that we thought we were going to have, you know, all spring. Um, But instead, we just change vectors a little bit and now we have a new way forward we're optimistic about it you know as you know I hope you guys are too with all the challenges I know everybody faced a lot of challenges um but we kind of like to start breaking it down from the new year and what we thought was going to happen Melissa you want to take it from the start um sure thank you Annabelle so we um all of us, as you know, um, JD and Annabelle are in the Air Force active duty, and as well as Annabelle is um, in school working to get her master's. Um, and so, uh, and then I, of course, have my companies and law firm that I'm working. So we have a lot of challenges with, uh, we really put in full time on our real estate business and then having families and then our careers that we're working on too. So we decided pretty early on that we were going to have to get some help to get some traction and get us moving forward at a quicker pace. We still could have got there with us doing it, but it would have taken longer. So we wanted to um, see about virtual assistants, if that would work for us, or if hiring people to work in the office um, and building a team out would work. And so um, did we originally just start with VAs or did we... We did, right? Yeah, I think we first okay. gave VAs a try. What was her name? Started with a P. Pam? Was it Pam? Her name was Carla. And that's Carla. Rude. Not even close to Pam. Nope. Yeah, well, Carla, Pam, same thing. Um, and, but that goes to show you how long she lasted. She was on our, very, our team very, very short amount of time. I'm not sure if, uh, because we have lots of friends and lots of mentors who are doing a lot of high quality deals, doing a lot of volume with virtual assistants. Uh, we have failed to make it work for us in regards to our lead specialist callers or acquisition specialist. We have had actually our longest running uh, employee at this point is yeah. Sujan, who is kind of a uh, shout out, Sujan. We appreciate you so much. <laughs> uh, 
but he doesn't he doesn't actually do calling for us. He does a lot of the online data entry stuff, uh, Craigslist postings, a lot of uh, one off type computer stuff that can be done virtually. Uh, he does for us, and and he's always uh, always done a really good job. Um, yeah. So not to say it can't work, just with the four companies that we tried, it didn't work for us. Right. And I think we really, really tried. I think we, we did. I think we did a good job on our part, but they would like not show up, not call us, not let us know. I mean, I felt we, we definitely trained them and equipped them to do the job. And I don't know if that was a failure on our part. We just have not been successful with VAs. Yeah. And some notes there are take in consideration the time difference because there's going to be a time difference, you know, where you have to train and they'll be calling and likely they'll have to be night shifters on their natural schedule um, if you're considering VAs. Um, And some also some other lessons learned from our VA experience, like Melissa said, is to take you know, take that training seriously. And a lot of, some of the VA companies will say like, we already, we already know how to do this, or we specialize in helping real estate investors, but just get, you know, get them familiar with your systems, your processes. Um, and, and you're right, Melissa, maybe that's where we could have worked a little harder, work differently perhaps. Um, but for now we decided that we are going to stick with in-person, uh, lead specialists in the office. Right. But, so that. yeah, that's been a challenge as well. So we, um, you know, we started out um, trying to locate people um, locally within the community through Facebook. Um, and then uh, we decided that we needed to maybe kick it up a notch, kick it up a notch. And we uh, pivoted and went through Indeed, which brought us a higher qualified uh, pool of people. Yeah. Um, JD, do you want to elaborate on our troubles with employees in the past or? Well, we've we've had lots of problems. We've had uh, problems from uh, everything from uh, people just no calling, no showing, uh, dropping off the face of the earth. Slippers, slippers in the office. Dress code violations. Um, We've we've had uh, a whole range of things uh, that caused difficulties um, and and that's not to say that it was a whole, solely on the employees, you know, a lot of leadership and guidance that you need to have when you're running a company, all of that responsibility falls on, on the owners of the company, or in our case, it, it falls on, on me to be the one responsible for training them and making sure that expectations are established clearly, guidelines are established clearly, and that everyone's on the same page moving forward. None of these people that accept a job to your company d- wake up and decide, you know what, today I want to do a shitty job. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of that failure comes from our ability or inability to manage people. And I think there was a lot of things that we learned with our first couple of employees on how we needed to do things better. Uh, And, and one of those big key pieces is uh, managing expectations Mm -hmm. and not giving uh, too much of the pie to somebody at one time to break it up into smaller pieces until those pieces are mastered. And that's kind of where we're, trying to go with those individuals now. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I think we were all excited. We, we, I mean, we still are. We, we're still excited, but we're all excited to bi- start building the team. We hired fast, really fast. Um, then, like JD said, we, we, we trained them quickly, and, and maybe sometimes they had a little bit too much responsibility or, or we gave them a little too much before they were ready for any extra. Um, and I think we, we learned from those mistakes. You know, we learned a lot of our mentors already. They told us that you should, how's the saying go, Melissa? You should hire slow and fire fast. Yeah. Yeah. So hire slow and fire fast. We learned that lesson. Um, and then, and then maybe take a little bit more time being deliberate about your choices because, you know, we would have to line up all three of our schedules to have an interview And then sometimes we would just say, yeah, let's give them a try. And I think unless we are all from now on where we're all, yes, this is someone we want to be a part of our company. They want to be a part of our company and we're in 
you know, unanimous agreement. Uh, I, that's kind of our way forward from this point. Well, I, I think uh, we didn't talk about quality of candidates, and, oh, the, yeah. and, and that's, that's an important piece to this. So, uh, Annabelle, I think if you could go into the way we started out hiring versus now. Yeah, when we were really excited, and at first we um, posted on just Facebook, and Facebook is a great place, you know, and we have a huge audience on a, a few of our different um, pages, but we were getting a lot of applicants and they either wouldn't follow simple instructions or, you know, no showed their first zoom interviews. Um, and they, I think what, like we touched on as we moved to indeed, we saw that they were a little better qualified. Um, why is that? I, I think because indeed they're active job seekers and then indeed has mechanisms where you put in your job descriptions and it can match, you know, them to their previous experience, their even tests that they've passed. And indeed, you can pay for, you know, what is someone's proficiency levels in sales or marketing and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you can better match the applicants to what you actually need for your positions. And it does cost a little bit of money. I think we never went over probably $20 a day. And we kept our ads open, you know, anywhere from two weeks to six weeks to make sure we had enough candidates applying. Um, but I think it was worth it because we did see people who were more qualified and who are more serious about seeking employment. Yeah. And just to um, uh, dive into that a little bit, just because, uh, you know, we want people to understand that we, not everything's perfect and we go through struggles and, and we've learned a lot, but um, the first couple people that we hired, um, and we didn't go into this lightly, like we talked about earlier on our first take, we talked about how we spent a lot of time building out exactly what the duties are and what that position looked like. And, um, and I think we gave a lot and I think um, we shared too much in retrospect about what was going on um, as a board and as a company that we probably would not do in the future. Um, well, l let me ask this though, uh, because I obviously I agree with your statements there, but now when I'm looking back at it, I'm wondering if the reason that we shared too much and uh, about the board and the company, was it that we shared too much or was it, it was the wrong people we had in those positions and they're the type of people that we shouldn't have been sharing that stuff with. I, and that's what I'm, I'm kind of, De debating you know because i like the open and honest environment but but that was not obviously that was not the the best way to go and there was just some stuff that, that maybe you know some people don't need to know about um you know the the cold caller doesn't necessarily need to know how the direct mail works right that's not not the same but um, was that because of the, the people that we had were the wrong people or is that because the exposing the entire playbook is the wrong thing to do? And I'm still, I'm still not convinced it is one way or the other, but I'll definitely be guarded about it in the future because we've, you know, gotten burned on it on the, the back end. Totally agree. And then, um, you know, I wanted to follow up with you on that. Um, agree with you on that maybe that was it but just to be honest um i became a target um for some bad things that were said yeah. uh, and about our company and about me and so that was so hard a time for us um and so i would just let people know that it's hard. It's hard. It's hard yeah. every day. It's hard, yeah. but it's worth it. And what our goal is and our end game is. And, um, you know, some days are just hard and, and, and that it helps because we have each other to get through that. When we um, have each other yeah. to get through that. Well, I mean, that was another huge thing with, I mean, because we had been used to, y'all being able to come and us pushing our business ahead, coming, you know, y'all were coming every few weeks. And then with COVID, <clears throat> I haven't seen y'all since February. February. Yeah. 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 February. So that's crazy. Um, 
just because it was like a hundred dollars for y'all to fly here. It was just like, everything was great. And so just, there's a lot of challenges when you start to build out your team and Mm -hmm. just have to keep pushing through and learn and pivot and just learn from your mistakes. And I think, um, that that's a great lesson that we all have learned and how to, to get better as you go on. So if we were going to summarize the thing, the things that we are doing now, actively doing now to be better at hiring people, training people, uh, and building that team, what are, what are those things look like? I think definitely using multiple hiring platforms. So we're not just limited, you know, to one, uh, social media page. We, we are on several, you know, with our company and with our opportunities that includes LinkedIn, that includes Facebook, that includes indeed, even occasionally on Instagram. I don't know how many active job seekers are on Instagram, but we'll let them know, uh, if I make a graphic or something like that. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're really being more thoughtful with that. Mm -hmm. And then we are also slowing down, I think Mm -hmm. a little bit We're we're taking our time more to think about, you know, the attributes that every applicant has, the experiences that every applicant has. Oh my goodness. We are calling references. That was one one thing. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I I wasn't calling the ref. I wasn't requesting references if they didn't provide them. I'd call them if they had provided them. Um, But now we're actively requesting references and I call, you know, and probably only 50% of people answer. Um, I leave a voicemail and, and even half of those people will call back, but people, you can get a, you know, a good vibe off of how much they want to share about someone or if they just want to say, yep, they're great and, and hang up the phone and just try to rush off the phone. Um, and I think that we're both pretty excited about our most recent hires because everything from their references to their resume, to their phone interview, to their zoom interview, where we really were thoughtful and took our time every single step of the way we were impressed. Um, and that was something we hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. And then also we are, like you said, just to elaborate a little bit more, we are taking our time. So before we drop a big mailer again, we're making sure you know, we're thinking out how to make sure that we have everything in place. Not everything's going to be perfect, but that we are doing the best that we can to make sure that we have people in place. When we do our marketing, we're not just throwing our marketing money away. Um, And as well as we divvied up more responsibility. So Annabelle was awesome and she took over where she's screening them. So it's not JD cutting out his time and me cutting my time, he's screening them so that then it's, we're pretty sure that that interview is going to go. Um, and I think that that has been better for us on the hiring side. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a good point. Our time is so valuable. Everybody's time, you know, we don't want to waste the applicants time either when they're actively, you know, seeking employment. So yeah. Yeah. And then JD said too, we're not, we maybe gave too much responsibility. We had these really high expectations and not that that's wrong, but start out on a smaller scale and build um, with giving people responsibilities, I think. And, And that comes with a, you know, a pay increase once you can take on more responsibilities. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Anything we miss for hiring or anything? I mean, there's a ton, y'all. So if you have questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Feel free to reach out. But I, I guess I, the one thing I want to make sure that we uh, stated, because I can't remember if we did in our last one or it was this one, was that the reason we chose Indeed and started finding better candidates from Indeed is because everybody on Deeds, Indeed is an active job seeker. Yeah. And on Facebook, they just happened to see the post and would click the button. And then, you know, half of them wouldn't show up to the to the Zoom interview. So I think that was the biggest uh, thing that I wanted to, to make sure is out there is that Facebook works and we found good people from Facebook, but the majority of the people on Facebook were uh, just clicking just to see what was going on, see what that looked like. They weren't actually looking for a job in the same way that folks on 
indeed were. And it's kind of funny because, you know, when we're talking about it like this, I didn't look at it necessarily like this before, but it's very, very similar to the way we market, the way we're marketing for these jobs is exactly the same way that we market for distressed sellers and market for uh, properties. It's essentially the exact same thing. We need to put our marketing out there in front of as many eyes as possible. And hopefully somebody that our message resonates with will contact us. And then if they contact us and we work for them and they work for us, then they come on to our team. That's exactly the same thing that we're doing with our uh, distressed seller marketing and, and home, home sellers uh, marketing. That's yeah. kind of funny. No, I was thinking that same thing too. That was, uh, that's exactly right. Yeah. We just need to get, we just need to push out more ads. It yeah. made me think of one more thing though. And this is kind of, I hope not to be, make it a conundrum or if we're talking back, but on what we previously said, but for some people you do have to move fast because that's another thing we faced where we had really qualified people. We were still, we were still having interviews for another four days. You know, say we interviewed our shiny star on Monday and then we had another four days of interviews scheduled to build our team. I wasn't following up until potentially the next, you know, the end of the week or even the next week occasionally. And in that case, those really qualified people had already been hired. Um, And that, I think that was at least once or twice where we had people, we weren't sure yet, but once we had a few more interviews and we're like, Oh yes, that person was really awesome. And then by the time I followed up, they just, well, part of that came from our inexperience in hiring. Like if you don't know what's a good candidate, you don't know what's a good candidate and you hadn't done a ton of those interviews before. And then part of it comes from the qualities that we admire and that we want in our business, part of our core values, you know, uh, optimistic action takers. So uh, those type of people, they're not going to wait around for, for us to come back to them with, with a job four days later, you know, when, when they're out there moving and shaking and trying to, to feed their families they're going to go out and get the next best job that they can yeah. no and we didn't realize that at first but we learned <laughs> yeah no nope, we did for sure that's really good stuff can you touch on traction a little bit jd and just kind of how that set us that was really i feel like our foundation when we decided all right let's build this team yeah. and we're still like melissa said we're still learning and evolving every single day but this the book, it's a book, Traction, was definitely a good place to start for us. Yeah, uh, tr- Traction was written by uh, a guy named uh, Gino Wickman, and uh, it's it's a phenomenal book. It, it It's almost, you know, uh, some of the pivotal books in my life. One was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That's what started me into investing and real estate and everything like that. And the next book uh, that, that really had that same kind of effect on me was, was Traction. And Traction is um, the it's a book that describes the entrepreneurial operating system, which is a system that you can apply to any business or any company that shows you it's already done for you. Everything is done for you. It shows you how to work your business uh, because a lot of times uh, people get into this habit of doing busy work, which is, you know, like coming up with your LLC name and creating business cards or designing your website for days and days and days and hours hours and hours and hours, but you don't ever actually do anything. Uh, The system that Traction operates in, it it breaks down a couple different key positions and then it takes you through uh, your goals, essentially. You have to read the book or listen to it on audio to to really understand it, but it shows you how to break down your uh, three-month goals in big goals and small goals and taking positive steps towards them. It also talks about having uh, these meetings and and um, in in these meetings that you have, either weekly meetings and also quarterly and annual meetings, um, you are responsible for, or each person in your company, each section in your company is responsible for a key number. This number is a KPI, Key Performance Indicator, and, and that's your number that you're responsible for. So you've got to find the right numbers uh, to indicate whether or not your business is doing well. And, and it just completely changed my paradigm. It, it made me think about business in a different way. And I didn't realize that, it, that you could be like that and that there were actual numbers that indicated whether your business was doing good or not. And 
when we decided that we were coming together as a business and we we're going to start hiring people, uh, I had just finished reading that book and I tried to design our business based off of that um, system and and you know we're not as faithful to it and and as strict to it as we probably should be if we wanted to be uber successful uh but we're taking steps towards that every day and we when we operate with that system in mind we seem to move further faster um at a better pace so it's a huge huge book uh in my life and i i think he made me read it too it's good (laughs) i'd make everybody read it no, I did too. I, I did the audible. Yes, it was, it was great. It was super great. And we, we have tried and, you know, we've had a little setbacks lately um, because of all of our um, commitments that we had um, in our, our quarterly meetings and, you know, just setting our goals. And then, you know, to piggyback on what you said, uh, extreme ownership was huge too. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that's what helps us be super successful um is because we all instead of us all trying to do everything we've all taken ownership of certain areas of the business to move it ahead um you know so annabelle does all the marketing and so we all stay out of her lane for that and you know i try to manage the short-term rental and so that nobody has to deal with that and you know those kind of things so um that's also those two books are, are huge. But in, in, in the same in the same note as that, if the marketing doesn't go out on time, whose fault is it? Right. It's my fault. Well, or Melissa would say that it was her fault, and Annabelle would say well, it's her fault, and that's because the you know the principles of extreme ownership is that you are taking control and responsibility for everything that is happening in your sphere of influence and and anything that can be affected by you is uh and that helps a lot especially because very very rarely if ever have we pushed blame for something not getting done or a certain way um and it's really it's really hard for me to look at melissa and say uh melissa you didn't send out that marketing you know when when melissa is saying hey i'm sorry you know i should have reminded you guys that that marketing was supposed to go out out today let's schedule a meeting this evening and get it out by midnight right and 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 you know the same it's the same thing when when we're willing to accept our faults and try to be self-aware um then we don't struggle as much as i've seen other people and other businesses um struggle True. No, agree. Yeah, those are really good points, guys. All right, now, should we open this other can of worms, this COVID-19? Yes, definitely. It's been super rough. We had just gotten our short-term rentals both on, they were both just starting to get going. They were all getting booked up. How many canceled uh, uh, canceled bookings did we have? When- all of them. <laughs> Yeah, two months we lost two months like within that as soon as it is you know the second week of march as soon as the publicity started coming out then people just started canceling and then and and what we were vacant melissa for months i mean it went from march the end of march to it so june june the first week in june yeah and so that was just such a huge pullback for us just because which, had, that's just three months, so that's not really that big of a deal. But if it was we our were, first season. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. It's our first season, so we had just dumped a ton of money into the purchasing of the property, making sure everything got done right. We just dumped a ton of money into um, the, the furnishing. The management and the marketing. And- right, setting up all the websites and all of the uh, digital locks, all, all of that stuff. We, we put a ton of money into it, and we were trying to hurry up to get it on, on market right in time for spring break in Panama City where these are uh, spring break is the biggest time of the year it's where I think uh, roughly 80% of the revenue for short-term rentals in that area come in during this time frame and then we lost it we lost that first initial spring break and it wouldn't have been you know it's not that bad and we're still gonna be okay we're still gonna recover we had to eat a couple months of mortgages and uh, HOAs and all that kind of stuff as well um 
but the fact that it was right during spring break, which is the, the biggest money maker of the year, made it that much worse. Uh, we're back on track now. We're starting to get our bookings back, and and that's all um, fine. We're going to be okay. It's just not as good as we had initially hoped, and that was a little bit uh, frustrating to say the least. Right, Melissa? No, for sure. And <laughs> you you look at it more from a up here position but annabelle and i we were so we had poured our hearts into them we, did. So we were just like we were so invested and in love with that and then it was just such a a boom to lower on us but um you know we're getting new bookings every couple of days now so I also think it wouldn't have been that bad if the entire if if the governor of the state of Florida hadn't have said, "Hey, no more short-term rentals." Like not not like, "Oh, you can, you know, rent them out at half occupancy, but no more short-term rentals." Or if he would have said no hotels. It's right. And for me to be here and see all these people at the hotels and know that those people could be in short-term rentals and they weren't allowed to. It just that was just so ridiculous. I can't. Yeah. Even, yeah. When really just like sanitarily, you know, yeah. wise, like, wouldn't it be clean? I don't know. I think our house is probably cleaner than any hotel room. Absolutely. Especially since there's only been like six people that stayed in them and two of them were us. <laughs> um, but I think that hotels do have some other regulations and oversight that short-term rentals don't necessarily have as far as cleanliness. And just because we're doing the right thing doesn't mean that everybody else is doing the right thing as far as sanitation and all of that is concerned. Um, But I, I do think that it could have been better. Uh, But um, the real question is, Melissa, if I would have told you, uh, you know, while, while those units were being built and we were looking at at purchasing them or even right after like, Hey, do you think the world's going to stop for a certain number of time and that the governor of Florida is going to say that we're not allowed to do this? There's, is there any way to prepare for that? Now, I'll be the first to admit, I don't think that we were prepared for that, but is there, should we have been able to anticipate that? Is there something numbers wise, could we have anticipated that? No, but the the follow-up question is, would we do anything different? And I wouldn't have done anything different still. And I think that's a testament to you guys, you know, with both of your real estate experience combined with knowing, you know, we were, we knew we were starting a new challenge last year when we said, okay, let's do short-term rentals. But by making sure we weren't just 100% short-term rentals, you know, we, yeah. we did three wholesale deals during that same time period where we had no bookings. Mm-hmm. So that's awesome. And we still had, we actually had new tenants move in to a couple of our rentals during that same time as well. So I think you guys have built, you know, some redundancy in, in our systems and kind of like diversifying our real estate where yeah. we're, we're not relying solely on wholesales. Okay. We're not relying solely on long-term or solely on short-term rentals. And that really, that really kind of saved me really what, what helped tremendously uh we still would have been we'd be hurting a lot more right now um but uh all of my rental renters paid except for one which is the the one family uh that i've had in there um for yes. since, since we started it was our very first property 2014. and and they were unable to pay that very first month um which they notified our property manager that that was the case. And then, which is crazy because before this, they've been the same renters. And I know this isn't, first off, this isn't sound real estate investing advice. So, so, you know, if, if you're going (laughs) to, don't pay attention to this part, but I would almost be happy when these tenants paid late because I knew they were always going to pay plus the fees and, and, um, catch themselves up and, and they're good tenants. They take care of the place. They, they made it their own. They've lived there, you know, for, for a long time. And so when they're late, it's like a, a, you know, a $40 bonus into my cash flow. That's the wrong way to look at things. We shouldn't, you know, we still file the, the, uh, a three day pay or quit or five day pay or quit, whatever it is in Louisiana. But we understood but, too. We knew everybody was facing mm-hmm, hard times, mm-hmm. you know, we saw Melissa, it was, she watched the beach co- close down. Like, completely 
But the great thing is they got their stimulus check and then instead of going out to, you know, buy a new flat screen TV, they caught, they, they caught up their rent and, and haven't missed a payment since. So, um, yeah. you know, we, because we had semi-stable, and I don't know if that comes from being close to military towns. Uh, Melissa, did any of your rentals uh, be un unable to pay or? I was super worried just because all of mine are on the east coast of Florida. So it's, it's a tourist driven. They're all workers that are in a, in a tourist driven um, communities too. So, but everybody paid. I didn't even have anybody pay late. So it was, it was awesome. So I was, I was thankful for that for sure. Yeah. yeah. And then obviously our wholesale community. I mean, we saw a lot of people who we had a couple under contract, right? That, you know, that, the first couple weeks of March and those people actually backed out the buyers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The buyers actually backed out just cause they weren't sure what the economy was going to do. Um, but in that case, Melissa has earnest money requirements and, 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 you know, that's part of the reason why. And then we had, we still had the opportunity to market them again. And then we found new buyers. Um, but even that at first, and I know of course all markets were different, but we didn't know which way that was going to go either. It was pretty, um, nervous. Yeah, I was really nervous, uh, during that time period too. Uh, and that's just because there was, it was such a dynamic time period. Everything was changing. The reason that a lot of those buyers backed out is because either their private money or hard money, uh, mm -hmm. weren't able to honor the agreement that they had previously had. And that happened to us too. We went, yeah, uh, Melissa, what were, what were the, what were the fees that went up on that hard money? Oh my gosh. It went from, Nine ninety five to four thousand for a funding fee for the for the loan funding fee, and that was extremely discouraging now, really, three thousand dollars shouldn't make or break your deal, but three thousand dollars was just it, and then they also raised the points or the uh, the percentage um, that we were paying per month yeah, and so uh, on the deal that we were using them for it was a slim, slim deal anyways. And so most deals, you probably would, that wouldn't be a big deal, but are that deal that we were going to do hard money lending, it was so tight anyway. So, and then it was like, you know, after we, after we backed out, we got backed out of the hard money, but then we ended up selling it anyways. Uh, so that we were thankful for that. Then they came back and said, Hey, we'll lower it. Are you still interested? I'm like, no, that time's passed. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we had to move, you know, we couldn't exactly. But then also talking about COVID, we had the big thing about what are we going to do marketing? I mean, everybody yeah. around us was not marketing anymore. Even, and, even a lot of our mentors, a lot of the people doing a lot more volume than us, people doing the same amount of volume as us, uh, a lot of them pulled back. Um, so we wrestled with that uh, for a week or two, you know, what should we do, you know, and then we decided to move forward and we had a good return rate on that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think one of the things that's important to note is they were mailing every single week and we weren't necessarily mailing every single week. And the weeks that they saw bad returns were the weeks when it was either initially announced or a new set of restrictions were announced. And in our area, we didn't happen to send any mail out on those weeks. So I'm not sure if that was a luck thing or if oh, strategic timing, <laughs> strategic timing. Well, they, you know, that, that is true. Um, that, that, well, that's something to say. We definitely would have stopped it had we thought that that was going to happen. But uh, for us, sending the mail out was the right thing to do. And now we're, we're back on it. You know, we're, we're making plans for this quarter. Um, and you know, we still don't know exactly what the economy is going to do as we enter this recession or whatever it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're going to continue moving forward. And we still don't know. I mean, they've had like 2,500 new cases. And so they're talking today about going backwards. So I don't know even what that looks like. But. So we're in phase two right now. Is that what it, what it is? Mm -hmm. And so they're talking about pushing us back into phase three. Yeah, I don't even know what that looks like. It's yeah. just a concern. So, but we just got to keep moving and, you know, 
And then our other marketing thing, if we're talking about uh, different challenges, is, is that some people thought JD and I were not stylish in our pictures, which <laughs> I can't believe it. JD, what, what did that guy say? Uh, he said, so... Leave a message. Called oh. us back to leave a message and said um, that we were a joke, that we were vultures, that um, we had no style, and that we needed to get professional photos uh, because the photos that we used were disgusting or something equally horrible uh, that I'm really glad Annabelle wasn't in those pictures because it hurt her feelings. But me and Melissa just laughed about it. Um, he was really great, angry. By the way, they look amazing in those <laughs> photos and those are professional photos. Yeah, they are. We pay like $500 <laughs> to have our photos done on the beach. And, uh, uh, well, there's nothing wrong with shorts and flip flops when you're in Florida. Nothing. I think it's great. Yeah. I mean, would want people in a suit i mean and that's not us we were staying true to ourselves oh, oh right yes for sure so i was just trying to think what we were talking about all the crazy stuff that's happened um and that was one of my highlights for sure <laughs> There's been quite a few. Guys, if you have questions about the challenges we face, we really are open book. So Janie's going to have the expert, you know, response. Melissa's going to tell it. Tr she's going to tell the truth. You know, she's going to let you know. If you guys have any questions, where should they reach out to you guys? Um, well, right now you can reach out on uh, our Facebook page. Um either the YouTube channel for the Real Estate Jam, the Real Estate Jam um pages are great. Uh, if you want to reach out to me directly, you can get me at JD at shorefrontrestorations.com. Or if you forget info at shorefrontrestorations.com. And of course you can message us, um, on messenger for sure too. Yep. Yeah. Thanks guys. We hope you took something away today. All right. Bye. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to The Real Estate Jam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, check out our website, shorefrontrestorations.com, or find us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Shorefront Restorations. If you have any questions, feel free to drop us an email at info at shorefrontrestorations.com. See you next episode.